Hello, this is Professor Workbench, welcoming you back to part two of our Economics of Tool Buying series. So in part two of our series, we're talking a lot about budgeting, needs, wants, and how to manage your cash flow. So let's start with the basics. What you need does not equal what you want. Such a basic principle. I would hope even like a five-year-old can understand that, but we blur the line all the time. I want to go on vacation. I need to eat dinner. Those are not the same thing. So we have to first separate out our needs from our wants so we can straighten out our finances. So if we look at the essentials in our lives, we've got, you know, what I might look at as, you know, a five-way set of essentials. You know, we got our mental health, our physical health, our spiritual health, our social health, but somewhere in the middle and all that is our financial health. That when we're financially unhealthy, it's going to affect us in all sorts of ways. That's going to affect the mental toll that our lives take on ourselves, the kind of work that we have to do. You might not find yourself in some physical pain, social pain because you just can't afford to go out with your friends, or maybe you went out with your friends too much, or you've engaged in the wrong socializing, and you've been stuck going to casinos. You know, your spiritual health and your giving, all of these all unfortunately have money involved you know money is not everything in life but it can certainly help make things just go a little bit easier you know we've got other essentials things like food shelter or housing clothing utilities gas electric water fuel for vehicles so on and so forth access to transportation or vehicles, but some folks that could mean a bus pass, that could mean a train ticket, or whatever is appropriate for where you live, or even uh, access to Uber, or Lyft, or a ride-sharing service would be appropriate too. Healthcare, we've got to keep ourselves healthy. If we're not able to, if we're not healthy, it makes it much harder to work. And living on disability should not be anyone's desire. That should be at the at the absolute bottom of everyone's list of things to do. And also on the essential list, we have to pay our debts. If we've borrowed money from someone, we have to pay it back and maintain that. As well as saving for the future and saving for rainy days. These are all essential things that we need to do. So some more examples. You need new boots to do your job. Probably need new casual shoes for the off hours. But that does not mean you actually need a pair of Yeezys, you know, a pair of casual shoes that are about 220 bucks, give or take. But these are routinely notorious for going for uh, just short of 3000 or more. Absolute waste of money. I don't care if you're a sneakerhead or what kind of person you think you are. Nobody needs a pair of gym shoes that are almost $3,000 or paying 220 bucks for. You need tools to do your job. I get that. Tools to repair your house. Tools to work on your vehicle. Tools to fix things. You can save money with tools, but you don't need to own every tool in the truck or every tool in the store. So if you don't work on Volkswagens or Audis, you probably don't need triple squares. Just in general, I don't think anyone needs to waste money on nut drivers. Um, certain folks don't need CNCs. We can keep running down the list of things that are needs and wants. And chances are uh, there's plenty of things that, you know, they're fun to have, but they're not going to make or save you money. And so that's where we have to draw the line. So to get to our objective, we need a budget. In the words of Benjamin Franklin, if you fail to plan, you're actually planning to fail, unfortunately. So that means we've got to set up some goals. This is how we get and achieve where we want to go. You know, one of the things we, nobody wants to do is live paycheck to paycheck. That's just basically living on the border of being broke and out of money, and that's just not any fun. You don't want to be in that situation. You need to be able to move forward with your life and not be living on the edge. You also don't want to be throwing away excessive amounts of money on debt service, otherwise known as interest. You know, that's just money going down the black hole that you're getting nothing for, or it's a penalty for buying things early before you had a chance to save for it. Some people refer to that as the poor tax. 
You also may want to have a rainy day fund. You know, every now and then something's going to go wrong. Your water heater breaks in your house. Something breaks on your car. You've got to get it repaired to be able to get on with your life. And you need to have some money set aside to be prepared for that. It's just a fact of life. It's going to happen. You know, you've got kids. Think about their education. Having money set aside for whatever that may be. You know, college and trade schools and whatever else they may be going into isn't free. And if you can put some money aside to help them in the future, that's fantastic. That will give them a far better start. I think we should always want better for our kids than what we had for ourselves. As well as retirement. Let's face it. None of us plan on working every day until the day we die. We want to be able to enjoy our golden years later in life. We want to be able to have some money available to do that. So we can travel. We can see grandkids. We can see family. We can do whatever it is that we want to do and be able to relax. I mean, sure, we can still have a job if we want a part-time job and greeters or, you know, whatever else that you want to do. That's fine, but you shouldn't actually need that job to survive. And your life will just be more pleasurable if you can live comfortably. But living comfortably does not mean that you need to be driving a Rolls Royce to be able to get around town. Living comfortably means you're not living paycheck to paycheck, that you've got some fudge funds that you can go out to dinner on a whim if you want to. If you want to go uh, out to a movie, you you can do it. And you've got that freedom to be able to, you know, have some fun with your money and to be able to give. Give to church, give to charities, support the Boy Scouts, support whatever else you want to support uh, with your money so that others can benefit uh, from your finances. So now as we're thinking about setting a budget, and I've seen this gone wrong horribly with the way some folks try to approach budgeting. There's the amount of money that you make every year or out of every paycheck, and that's your gross earnings, and that's the amount of money that you get paid before taxes and benefits get taken out. It's very easy whenever I've uh, taken out home mortgages, they want to calculate my the amount that I qualify for based on my gross earnings. But I flat out deny that. That is the wrong method to calculate how much debt you should take on and how to budget. We have to think about after those are taken out, and that's known as your net income. The government's always going to get its share. Just go ahead and admit to it. It's just the way it is. Don't even plan on having that money available. Just forget about it. It gets taken out of your paycheck. You know, if you work for yourself and you've got to file quarterly, set that money aside. Don't budget for it into your rest of your personal spending plan. And so just again, gross income is always greater than net income. Taxes are non-negotiably a fact of life. And so when we make our budget, we want to make it on net earnings. So now it's time for a quick self-assessment. You know, if you take out a piece of paper and a pen or open up an Excel spreadsheet, that works as well too. List out all of your recurring expenses. List out periodic expenses. You know, certain things like car insurance might come every three months or every quarter or twice a year, for example. I know for me, my trash bill is paid quarterly. And I write down all these expenses, whether it's mortgage, rent. I've just got a quick list here of things that may apply to you. Gas, heating, water, trash, insurance, fuel repair, cable, satellite, givings, health care, prescriptions, uh, gym memberships, debt payments, savings, and investment. List all those out. Put them down in writing in front, you know, and uh, in the process of doing so, you may see some surprises. Do you realize how much you're spending every year on your cable bill? You know, for many of you, that may also include your internet connection. How much you're paying per year on a gym membership? You know, are you actually using the gym membership? And are you actually getting your money's worth out of it? I don't know. Something for you to think about. And then come back and list all your income. You know, one of the things that's important to think about when you look at the income and your expenses, depending upon how often you're paid and when your expenses come due, can affect how you have to budget. You know, it's very common for some folks if you, that you might have a bunch of bills due at the beginning of the month and the amount of money that you have out of the paycheck that might come earlier in the month 
or on the last day of the month or whatever your payment plan is, you may have to be able to roll some of that over into uh, your the amount of money that you've got budgeted until your next paycheck because your cash flow may not be equal and equivalent uh, all the way across the month. If you need some help doing this, online banking may already uh, possibly track some of this for you, but I still think it's healthy to write it down, make an Excel spreadsheet, go through the manual exercise, having to look at and type in or write down all of these numbers. It'll help you make your money a lot more personal. With today's online spending and swiping of a card, rather than opening up your wallet and taking out bills, bills as in paper dollars, you know, it's easy to think that money just kind of, it just kind of comes and goes and it's this kind of ambiguous thing. You know, if you go back, you know, before the debit and credit cards were pretty popular and you looked in your wallet and it was empty, you went, I have no money. That's just the way it was. But now with the swipe of a card, it's easy to give in the temptation and to buy something that you actually don't have the money for. And so then as appropriate, you might want to establish other categories of personal spending, you know, whether that's going out to eat, whether that's buying tools or whatever you find appropriate, uh, buying gifts at uh, the holiday times, buying an anniversary present uh, for a love uh, for your spouse, you know, make sure you budget for those kinds of things as well. You know, if you want to go out to happy hour, you need a date night or travel, budget for it. It's okay. As long as you got the money for it. If you can't find a way to work it into your budget, well, then you need to rethink your lifestyle. But that's where we're starting at here, that we need to think about where we're at. And so at this point, this is what I would call a financial autopsy. When we look at your old bank statements... And if you go back in history, if you go back through the last three months, six months, or maybe even 12 months and try to track all of your spending and how much have you spent eating out, how much have you spent at the hardware store, how much have you spent on bills and utilities, you know, look at where your money's going. Until you establish where your money's going and what your cash flow looks like, it makes it much harder to plan for the future. And quite frankly, you might <laughs> be a little scared or embarrassed after you look at your numbers. You know, it's pretty easy to see, you know, some patterns that, you know, you may, maybe you realize you've got a guilty pleasure uh, going certain places. You know, for me, it's usually going out to lunch. You know, you look at the patterns and you go, well, what can we do to change that? You know, what are ways that we can be saving money, banking money? Do we need to buy our groceries at the most expensive store in town? Are there places that we can, other ways that we can save money? Now, most importantly, and I don't know why I have this last, is that if you're married, you need to involve your spouse or significant other in this. That their money, his money, her money, it's your money together. And if you're trying to get things in order and make things ship shape, but your spouse is not on board, you're going to have a leaky boat and a leaky boat is destined to sink. So let's go through a few priorities. Our first priority is going to be to adjust our lifestyle so that the amount of money we have coming in is greater than the amount going out in bills and other expenses. So how do we tackle that? So we have to consider both sides of the equation. We've got income and we've got expenses. You know, if you need to get your income up, you know, can you put in overtime? Is there any way you can get a promotion? Can you get a second job, do some side work? What can you do to advance in your career to be able to bring in more money? Can your spouse bring in some more money too? Work as a team. On the other side, how can we reduce expenses? Think about things that might be unnecessary. Gym membership, cable TV, reducing utility consumption. You know, in the spring and fall, do you need the AC if you can open windows? You know, for many of you watching my channel here, learning DIY skills for repairs is going to be second nature because a lot of us love fixing things and that can be a way to reduce expenses. Now, you may have to communicate with your spouse or significant other that sometimes that requires some upfront investment of cash to be able to buy the tools necessary to do that. But over the long term, you can save some serious money. First couple times you learn to do an oil change, you'll be behind because you've bought jacks and jack stands and wrenches to do it, but eventually you'll see a net return on that investment. And then finally here, set up a payment plans 
on existing debt. How can you tackle it? Your debts are going to have generally a minimum monthly payment, but what's the way that you want to handle that? You got to pay your minimums, but can you pay more than that? And can you strategically allocate your extra funds because the amount coming in is greater than the amount going out that we can find a way to get ahead on our debt while not incurring new debt? And if you can't manage making sure that your income is greater than your debt payments every month, you're going to be doomed to fail at the, at the rest of this exercise. This is the foundation of what it takes to be able to get ahead. So priority number two, thinking about a rainy day fund. Things are going to fail. Things are going to go wrong. And this should also not be confused for a vacation fund. Vacations need to be budgeted for just like anything else. A vacation is a planned trip. Now, perhaps the contrary to this is if you need to make an emergency travel to deal with the death of a loved one, maybe that might be a valid use of a rainy day fund. But just simply going on vacation to get away for a week, eh, that's not a good use of a rainy day fund. We need to think more serious about that. So how much money should you have in there? Well, one good starting point is look at, well, what's the combination of your deductibles on your insurance? If you've got $500 deductibles on your auto insurance and you have to be able to come up with that money immediately, well, then you need at least $500 in there. $1,000, you need to have 1,000. What's the deductible on your homeowner's insurance if you own your home or a condo or whatever it is? Those are some good bottom numbers. But you also might need to have more than that to be able to have available when other needs arise, you know, ideally you want to have about one to two to three uh, times your monthly net income stashed away that's immediately available. So priority number three, stop paying the poor man's tax, also known as interest. And so to tackle this, we need to be able to check the interest rates on all of our debts recognize some debts actually may be okay. We have to have a place to live. So if you've got a mortgage out on that, and they, they, there may be some tax deductions available on that. If you went to school and you got some student loans or you bought some tools on your student loans, again, tax deductions may apply. Perfectly fine. But we also need to be able to kind of shore up the other end so we don't have money leaking out the other end with unnecessary debts. Pay down our smallest amounts to our highest amounts. Consider interest rates if you need to reshuffle the deck. But under any circumstances, if you have any payday or title loans, pay those off. Those are an abomination to mankind. And by no means should you ever, ever set foot in one of those places. And your goal is to get rid of those if you have them and say goodbye and never, ever get those again. Work on your credit cards. If you've got medical bills, I'd put those towards the back of the line, but ultimately, never, ever, ever skip a debt payment. Maintain your credit rating, make your minimum monthlies, and then try to be able to allocate the rest of your funds that you have available to getting rid of your debt. Think strategic about this. You know, there's several other uh, financial folks out there that can have well-established plans to help you out with this. One of those is Dave Ramsey. Uh, he's got a book on this subject as well. Priority number four is for saving and investing. In other words, time to get ahead. And so the power of compound interest, which I'll talk about in my in part three of my video series here, is, in, is just simply immense. There is no substitute for time. Saving and investing now means it's going to cost you far, far less in the future. Youth is your friend. The sooner you can start saving, the younger you are when you're saving, the less you have to save each month because the interest and the compound effect of that is going to work on your side and it's just going to just snowball out of control. And so in other words, what we're talking about here is making money with money. But as long as you're strapped down with, it, with debt, you're actually working in reverse. You're paying money to be able to pay money. In other words, you're paying interest for the ability to be able to pay money later 
versus making money with money. And these are exponentially opposite sides of the same financial picture. And so saving money can be done side by side with paying down your bills, you know, particularly so if you've got retirement plans and your employer uh, has some form of a matching compensation. You know, if you put in 3% and your employer matches 3%, you know, you're getting 3% of your earnings uh, for and what's basically free money to you. And if you turn that down, you know, you're missing out on that free money. And over time, that's going to hurt you. I know some other individuals recommend shutting off retirement contributions, but as best as you can, if you can keep that on while you've got some debt and just be able to manage your cash flow, it's hard to be able to argue with the exponential savings amount that's created by savings. So then for success, whenever you get a bonus, supercharge your savings. You know, whether that's a tax refund, a raise, holiday or birthday cash. The key important thing here is to maintain the same steady lifestyle. Don't run out and buy a new car. Don't go out and take out a new debt payment just because you got a raise or a bonus or a promotion. Maintain the same lifestyle so your income went up, but your bills and expenses and everything else remain the same. And now you're leveraged even better to get rid of debt more quickly. And so if we can balance pros and cons of purchases, you know, one good example of this is if you think about buying a newer car, newer cars are going to have higher insurance costs than older cars. They're also, depending upon your state, may have higher registration, excise taxes, plate fees, you know, but they may have reduced fuel consumption, but usually that amounts to a marginal amount over the course of the year and increased maintenance costs. If you're watching my channel, you probably are into tools and those maintenance costs, you know, actually might not frighten you because you could do it yourself. And when I think about return on investment, you know, if it's going to take me more than 12 to 24 months to actually to earn the equivalent amount back on a purchase, you know, then it just needs to wait. If I can, if I can buy a tool today and I'll make that equivalent amount I just spent back very quickly, then yeah, go ahead and, and make that purchase uh, before you, the rest of your debts paid off. You know, if you can buy, if you can buy something that helps you do a job quicker, easier, allows you to do more work. Yeah, that makes sense. But if it's going to take you more than 12 to 24 months to pay it off, it's not worth it. You know, for example, if you want to pick up some side income of hauling out uh, trees and debris out to the country uh, from some city folks and getting some cash on that or making dump runs or whatever it is that you want to do. Don't go out and buy a new 2017 pickup truck for that. The return on investment just simply will not be there on that. You know, if you could find uh, a working 1985 pickup truck that will do the same thing for 500 bucks. Now you're talking about getting ahead. Otherwise, you're making some more money, but you just took on a bigger debt. And you're actually getting further and further behind. And... Uh, my final point here, just say no to boats. There is nothing good that ever came from buying a boat. It's just a rabbit hole of expenses. It's a luxury item for the wealthy to be able to show how quickly they can flush money away without caring. If you're having issues with debt and getting out of debt, don't buy a boat. It is the absolute worst expense that you can take on, especially if you're buying a boat with a loan. So with that, I want to thank you for watching part two. I've got one more video coming out, and I'll probably be out in the next month. Uh, if you haven't seen part one, go back and check that out. Remember to like, share, and subscribe. And I look forward to seeing you in future videos. Thanks, and have a great day. Bye.